Hey everybody, and uh, welcome to my lecture on computer history, the history of computational devices. Uh, uh, if you watch this lecture in class, you don't have to watch this online, but if you haven't been able to join us in class, uh, if you're somewhere else or if you're watching this many years from <laughs> where I recorded it, uh, then you're, you're going to want to watch and pay attention. Uh, there's also a supplementary document uh, titled something like History of Computational Devices or something like that, um, devices and uh, other things. Uh, you, If you have that open on your screen. You can follow along. I'm going to follow along with that document. I actually have it right below the camera right here. So if I look down, uh, you'll see that. And your assignment this week is to pick one of them uh, from the list and do a little bit more history on it. Say a little bit more about it than what I did. There's a form with an example. That's the assignment. If you're in my advanced computer science class, there also be a quiz on this. So this is going to be one of the longest lectures, but I'm going to make it as entertaining as possible. At moments in the lecture, a box will appear somewhere right around there. And uh, yeah, right around there. And um, and then th those will show pictures of sort of what I'm talking about. If you watch this in class, these are just the pictures borrowed from the PowerPoint and the slides. So uh, follow along, buckle up, get ready, because we're going to cover 3,000 years of human history. The first thing you need to know, is that the human brain was not designed to do math. There are some human brains that are much better at doing math than other human brains. Uh, some of us are gifted in it and can do it very well. Typically, though, those human brains have actually been trained to do it. They've just been trained to do it better. There are proficiencies. But how humans do reason and logic is we look for patterns. We look for similarities between things. Computers do reason and logic using nothing but math. And in fact, any computational device you have, whether it's your smartphone, uh, whether it's the smart computer in your car that makes your car kind of a smart car, uh, whether it's a video game, whatever you're using. It's just doing math. All it's doing is adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. That's all computers do. But it's doing it very, very quickly, and it's doing a, all the combinations thereof and to do some cool things. So, uh, so since the beginning of history, humans have had to rely on external devices to do math, to help them with math. One of the earliest examples is the Assyrians had tablets. And these tablets uh, aren't like the tablets that I have that I'm actually filming this on. Uh, but these these tablets were basically multiplication, addition, and subtraction, and division tables, um, but with little indents in them. You can view the picture, look at the picture, you can see the indents, and then in those indents allowed them to make markings. It allowed them to uh, to mark where they were and sort of their formulas. So that's a very early example of a of a device that helped them do math, uh, helped them remember data. One of the basic functions of a computer is it can store information. And so by indenting their multiplication tables, they could store information and they have to remember it. Another great example of an early computational device is a cave wall uh, where they could just write the numbers they needed to remember on a cave wall, right? Um, or, you know, we have, a, that's like the ancient equivalent of like whiteboards, right? Whiteboards can do one thing computers can do, they can store information. And so, uh, so since the earliest of times, we have uh, relied on things to help us remember and do math. Then, fast forwarding a little bit in time, the Greeks had the abacus, which was basically sliders on poles. You've all seen an abacus. There's one right there. Um, and uh, those sliders helped them do math. It helped them. If I was adding two plus four, I'd put two here and four here, and uh, and then I'd count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's the ancient equivalent of using your fingers to do math. Uh, and so they had the abacus, um, and various forms of the abacus existed for centuries, um, if not millennia. People People are still using abacuses, or is it abacai? I don't know. People are still using those uh, clear up until like 1300s, 1400s. Um, the abacuses did get a little bit better in the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries. Um, they invented slide rulers, uh, which is kind of a, an update on the abacus that help people do math. They also had ledgers, accounting systems, things like that. They helped them store information, store mathematical information, spreadsheets, things like that. But it wasn't really until the mid 1600s, in the middle of what we now kind of call the steampunk era, or actually right at the beginning, when a guy by the name of Blaise Pascal invented the first calculator. 
It used gears and levers uh, to add and subtract. And they were big machines, uh, but they were super helpful and they could add and subtract really big numbers in a really short amount of time. You didn't have to do long addition and subtraction. You just turned one gear to a number and another gear to a number. And then the bottom gear uh, rotated and changed as you were doing that and gave you the output. Uh, 50 years later, another guy by the name of Gottfried Leibniz, uh, which is an awesome name, say that, Gottfried Leibniz, uh, he improved upon that and used Pascal's model of the gears and levers to add uh, multiplication and division. So those were the first calculators. They could still uh, only do one thing that computers could do, and that was math. They process information. We call that processing information. So, so the early stuff the tablets helped you memorize information. The slide ruler, the abacus, and then the first calculators helped you actually process that information or do math with information. Um, and so that is sort of our uh, getting into early history. Ancient history is sort of those things, but that sort of their calculators sort of kicked off uh, sort of the computational device era. And throughout the 1700s and early 1800s, you had plenty of people making all kinds of machines to do all kinds of things. Uh, but really, we look at early computer history beginning with another device that wasn't a calculator, actually wasn't invented to do math at all. It was invented to sew. And that was invented by a guy named Jack Ward, and he created a loom which is a sewing machine, a large sewing machine. But there was one really cool thing that Jack Ward's loom could do that made scientists and mathematicians sort of sit up and take notice and be like, wow, we can use that for all kinds of things. And that is it could store information and it could not just store data like writing on a wall, it could store a program. And so uh, the loom ran off of these big papers, uh, big rolls of paper, like long paper, not like a piece of paper, but long sort of paper-like product. And you punched holes in the paper and then you rotated the paper through the machine. And if one hole was punched, it would allow that fabric through and allow that sort of thread to be woven into whatever you were making. And then when the hole ended, then it would turn that that fabric off and then another hole would open allowing another thread or fabric to be woven in. Jack Ward's loom not only increased the amount you could sew in any given day, before that you had seamstresses, you had hundreds and hundreds of them just sewing clothes every day. Uh, so now you could just rotate a crank on his machine and you could do the same design over and over and over again and get the exact same design over and over and over again. Whereas if a woman or a seamstress is sewing that, uh, there'd be minor discrepancies. And so everybody sort of stood up and took notice because now it could store information, it could program things, um, and it could uh, accept inputs and outputs, which are the other two things a computer could do. So Jack Ward's loom is the first big machine that we look at and say, that's incredible. That's an incredible machine. And it didn't run off electricity. It didn't even run off steam. It just, you just cranked it. You just ran on human power. So that sort of begins the, com the computers, sort of early computer history. Uh, a few years after Jack Ward's loom, there was a guy by the name of Babbage who was hired to design an actual mathematical machine um, that could add, subtract, multiply, divide, store programs. And so he created it. It's called an analytical diff, uh, engine, or sometimes they call it the difference engine. And he wrote down the designs for this massive machine um, that could do everything a computer could do. It could store information, do math, take inputs and put outputs out. It was a large machine. It would fill this office behind me. This is my guest room office. It'd fill this room behind me. And unfortunately, he never actually, nobody ever gave him money to build it. And so in his lifetime, nobody ever built his computer, but at least it was the very first time we had it designed. We had it on paper. We had um, a, a computer sort of planned out on paper. Um, in the mid nineties, a uh, research team of uh, computer, computer technicians uh, decided to build his computer using only what would be available in his lifetime. So they did decide to build it. It's at a museum somewhere and that's what the picture right there uh, is about. And um, 
And so that's, you could go see it. I think it's in London, but don't quote me on that. If any of you want to do your assignment on that, you can look it up. And they proved that his machine would work um, if he had had the money to build it. And so it wasn't that, that we didn't have the technology yet. It's just that he didn't, it was just, it would have cost millions and millions of dollars in his day and they, he didn't have that much money. Um, so, uh, but there were many in his lifetime who used his designs and used his architecture to sort of make other machines to do various things. Uh, but the next big sort of thing that happened a few years after Babbage died is the 1890 census in the United States. For those of you who aren't United States citizens, or those of you who just don't know this, who are, uh, every 10 years, the U.S. Constitution mandates that a census be taken to count all the households and people in the United States. In fact, the last one just happened in few months ago, my wife and I got mailed a form, U.S. Census Bureau. We filled it out, sent it back in. Well, the problem in 1890 is that the population of the U.S. had grown so large that it would have taken 10 years to count every single person and to add all that up. And so that was a problem uh, because there, you know, you're supposed to take a census every 10 years. And if it's going to take us 10 years to do it, that means we're, we're in trouble. And by the way, the reason we do the census is to figure out how many uh, Congress people each sort of state gets to send to the U.S. Congress. And congressional elections happen every two years. And so if it's going to take us 10 years to figure out how many Congress people each state gets in two, um, well, that's a problem. So a guy by the name of Herman Hollerith, another awesome name, Herman Hollerith, uh, went about using some of Babbage's designs, but also some other things. And he invented a machine. Once again, it wasn't, I don't think it ran off electricity, right? It just ran off steam and, uh, and cranks and stuff. But he invented a machine um, with the, uh, where you could input all the numbers and it would save all the numbers and add all the numbers together. And the census was completed within a year. And uh, the congressional elections went off without a hitch, and it saved the day, really. So Herman Hollerith takes this big win, and he creates a company that's called IBM for International Business Machines. And he starts making computers, making machines like his census machine, uh, and putting them out into the business world. That uh, doesn't mean computers started to be everywhere overnight in 1891, but he just started inventing machine after machine after machine. While he's doing this, two other very important things happen. These are concepts, not machines, so don't write your uh, assignment this week on these. Uh, but the first thing that happens is a French guy by the name of Charles, uh, I think it's Charles Boulet, his last name's Boulet, um, he invents, just for fun, he invents a new numbering system. Now, we'll go into this later in class, I just want to introduce it here. Um, our numbering system has 10 digits that you can work with, 0 to 9. We have 10 different numbers. And, and then if we if we count to 10, you guys know, well, if we count to nine, you guys know how we get to 10, right? We add a digit. We add another number at the beginning. So we say we have one 10 and zero ones, and then 11 is one 10 and one one. 23 is two tens and three ones. You all took fourth grade math. You all should know that. Well, Charles Boulet said, well, what would happen if we only had two digits? What happened if all we have is a zero? and a one. Then if we wanted to count to 10, uh, we'd be stuck at, at one. But by the time we got to number two, and so what would we have to do? We'd have to count, we have to add a one. So in his numbering system, we call it Boolean algebra. After him, it's also called binary because it's, you just have two digits, a zero and a one. Uh, if you want to count to two, uh, you have to write 10, but the one doesn't represent one 10. It represents one uh, two, and then we have zero ones. And then uh, when we do three, it's one, ten, and one, two, and one, one. So that's three. And then when we get to four, though, we have to add another digit. So now it's 100, but it's not 100 things. It's, it's actually four things. It's just the one represents one, four, and then we have zero, zero ones and zero twos and zero ones. So he invents this cool new mathematical system and it's just a silly little brain project for him. But another guy also named Charles, Charles Sanders Pierce, picks it up and says, wait, 
Electricity is kind of becoming a thing now. This is the 1920s. Electricity is everywhere. It's the brand new thing everybody's talking about. Just like today, everybody talks about the internet as the brand new thing. Electricity was the brand new thing. Electricity works by flipping a switch on and off. And so if you have an electrical current, the electricity is either flowing or not flowing. It's on or off. I have a light switch right up here, uh, right next to where I'm filming right now, my camera. And if I flip it on, the light comes on. In fact, I'll do it for you. Bam, the light's on. And if I flip it off, the light's off. If I flip it halfway up, it's off. And when it, you know, there's, there's a point of where it's off and on. So Charles Sanders Pierce says, wait, what if we add thousands of switches? We could do math that way. We could use Boole's, Boolean algebra, binary. And we, if we had a thousand light bulbs, we could do math. And if the first light bulb was on, and the second light bulb was off, that means two. And if the third light bulb was on and the next two were off, that means four. And if both, if we have two and both are on, that means three. And so he creates this way, he uses Boulay's silly little math project, brain tease kind of thing. And he says, we can invent machines that do math using electrical switches because switches are on or off. You only have two digits. And that becomes the launching pad of the computer revolution. Then we have World War II. You have two different sides in the war trying to beat each other. And both the Germans um, and the Americans, the Allied and the Axis, um, start throwing tons of money into building computers so that they can outwit each other because human brains just can't do the math fast enough on the battlefield. And so in the World War II era, um, the governments of the world uh, start hiring computer engineers to actually make computers that'll help them win the war. One of the computer engineers they hired is a guy by the name of Von Neumann, and he defines what a computer is. Up to today, uh, we use his definition to define what a computer is, and we'll come back to this next week when we're talking about hardware. But Von Neumann uh, laid out a plan, and he said, that in order for something to be a computer, it has to do four things. I've already mentioned them in passing. He says it has to accept input. There has to be a way for a person to put data into it. So think a chalkboard. A chalkboard does input, but that's all it does. So a chalkboard is not a computer. Uh, a piece of paper accepts inputs and also it does the next thing. It puts outputs out, right? I can put information on a piece of paper and I can read information off a piece of paper. So uh, you have to be able to put information into it and it has to have a way to give you back information. So a chalkboard does those two things, but a chalkboard's not a computer because you need two other things. First, it has to do math. It has to process information. We call that a processor. Uh, and so it has to have a processor, a way to process information. It has to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And then, of course, the next thing it has to be able to do is store information. And so he said, you need those four things in order to make a computer a computer. It has to be able to receive information. It has to put that information back out. It has to be able to do math. And it has to store the information. So a chalkboard does three of those things, but it's not a computer because chalkboards don't do math. You do math using a chalkboard, but you're the one doing the math. Um, so he invents that. He does one more big thing that's important. He also creates a way for computers to not just store information, but to store programs, to store commands. Any program you use is just a list of commands. He creates a way for computers to not only remember information, but remember how to do something. And so if I have a calculator and I play one plus one and it says two, um, it's not a computer unless I can save that and say to my computer, run math problem, and then it runs again. That is huge. He invents ways for computers to do that. Jack Ward's Loom did that already with sewing, but he invents a way for computers to do it with mathematical equations. So out of this, they begin to use what's called vacuum tubes. There should be a picture of vacuum tubes right there. Uh, there it is. And, um, and so a vacuum tube is actually what was used in, in speakers. Uh, to amplify noise. All it is is a copper wire wrapped around a tube and encased in glass. Uh, you could see it right there. Um, and then if power was flowing 
through the cord, the sound would be amplified and you had a receiver at the end saying, I'm hearing the, the electricity is coming through. And then if I flipped it off, then it would say you had a receiver that said it's off. And so, uh, so uh, Von Neumann and multiple people around the world started creating computers using vacuum tubes. The problem with vacuum tubes is they were large, they were very expensive, they broke very easily, um, and you had to manually flip them. You had to be, somebody had to be the one that turned the button on and off. So they create two computers out of this. One is the ENIAC. The other is called the EDVAC. The ENIAC was created for World War II, but it was never completed in time uh, to be used in World War II. Uh, but the ENIAC was one of the first fully functional computers using von Neumann's architecture. It had 4,000 switches and they all had to be flipped manually. After World War II, they updated it with the EDVAC. They made it a little bit smaller um, and improved it, but it still and it could store programs, whereas the ENIAC couldn't. But you still had a bunch of people running around flipping switches. In fact, they had a team at one point of 400 mostly women secretaries whose job it was to run around a warehouse uh, computer flipping switches on and off all day. They'd go back to the desk. The desk would give them the printout of switches to flip. They'd go back. They'd flip them all, run back to the desk. And um, and that was their job, those, those poor women. They probably wore high heels too back then, which would have been awful on their toes and, and, their, and the balls of their feet. Huh? So, uh, so these are the first two computers, uh, the ENIAC and the EDVAC. They ran off these large vacuum tubes. You can see the picture there of all the vacuum tubes, uh, quite a lot of them. And, uh, and they were fully functioning, but they couldn't do a fraction. I mean, they couldn't even do a tiny little fraction of what your phone in your pocket can do right now. So, but these two launch the first generation of computers. We're going to kind of go by decades now, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then 80s, 90s, and then today. Um, and so this launches the first generation of computing. The first generation was run by IBM. I already mentioned that Earlier, they decided to start selling and making computers to the general public. Initially, it was Business Machines. That was their name, International Business Machines. And they sold computers like the EDVAC and the ENIAC. They sold them to corporations and corporations would clear out a floor and put this massive computer that could once again only do a fraction of what your phone could do. And they would put those right um, on that floor and they'd have teams of people flipping the switches on and off. But uh, throughout the 50s, the computers got smaller and smaller and smaller. The first computer to be sold to companies was called the Univac. Uh, it was another update on the EDVAC and the ENIAC, ran by the same technology, but they were able to make the vacuum tube smaller. Uh, they started to introduce uh, machines that would flip the switches manually, so you didn't have to have a person going to flip them. And so by the 50s, the word computer had become a well-known word. All those early computers ran off of what was now called binary code, which was basically Boulez and Charles Sander Pierce's system. And so the computer coding was all ones and zeros. And so they'd give you a printout of ones and zeros, and then you would know what switch that went to and you'd run around. So the 50s, suddenly uh, people are starting to work with them more, mainframes come out. All kinds of awesome things happen and people are starting to talk about this new computer age and these awesome computers I work with at, at work that make my job so much easier. And so in the 60s then, um, there was one more major um, thing that happens that revolutionized computers. And that major thing was a transistor. So eventually they realized flipping a switch, even if a machine is the one flipping the switch, it still takes forever. Uh, especially if you have thousands and thousands. I mean, remember the early computers had 4,000 switches, which isn't that much data. Um, and so they said sending someone to flip 4,000 switches or even just having a machine do it takes forever. Is there an easier way to do this than just flipping a switch on and off? And they realized, yes, there was. What if we used a semiconductor? And so copper, which is what the vacuum tubes were made of, is a conductor. Uh, copper wires are in all the walls around us. Uh, if I flip this light switch next to me, uh, what I have just done is there's two copper wires and the switch connects them and power goes to the light. Flip it off, it pulls them apart. So they said that takes forever, especially if you have thousands of them. So semiconductors, all that requires is a tiny little magnetic pulse. We're going to talk more about that next week, but it just requires a tiny little magnetic pulse. 
and the tiny little magnet pulls electricity uh, from one to another and you don't need a switch. You don't need anything mechanical. Uh, you just need a magnet, ma tiny little magnetic force to pull over. So transistors were cheap. They were tiny. In fact, you have billions of them in your pocket right now, which is crazy if you have a smartphone in your pocket. There's billions of them on my tablet, which I'm using to record this. They are they are microscopically small. Um, they are easy to produce. You can mass produce them. They don't break. Remember, vacuum tubes broke all the time. Uh, they are easy to drop. Uh, the copper wire shatters if you know if it's turned on and off too much. Transistors don't break at all, and they revolutionize computers. Now, instead of having a computer that fills a room or a house or an entire floor, uh, it's possible to have a computer that fits inside your on your desk at your home. Uh, maybe still a big desk in the 60s, but they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, the other thing that happens, the other big thing that happens in the second generation is we move from binary code, which is just ones and zeros, to an actual English or near English words to actually give commands to a computer. Assembly code still is not great, but it was a step up uh, from binary code, which we'll talk more about later. So, uh, so transistors revolutionized everything. And then in the third generation of computers, they started making chips. Uh, and chips was just multiple transistors on the same board. And so now we can put multiple switches all on the same board and it wasn't very big. Now we have computer chips and they're all integrated together. And that allows us to build an operating system. An operating system is a program that runs all the other programs. So Microsoft Windows is an operating system. It's literally a program that operates your system. So the first operating systems come out. Operating systems also make it way easier to use computers because you have all these stored programs in there. You can access the programs. Uh, another thing that happens in the third generation is um, the early computers could only do one thing at a time. And by the way, your modern computers can only do one thing at a time. Uh, but in the third generation, they realized that if we divide up the tasks um, and teach the computer to rotate through a list of commands, then the computers can look like they're multitasking. They're still doing one thing at a time. However, um, they are um, they are just doing it so fast, it looks like you have multiple programs up. So that allows computers to actually run multiple programs at the same time. And so if any of you have your internet browser right open right now and you have 30 things open at the top of it, that's time sharing. It's looking at each browser and uh, each window and saying, what do you need? 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 Okay. Uh, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? What do you, okay, what do you need? You know, it just cycles through them. Uh, you can open up your processes on your computer if you hit control alt delete. So time sharing, rev operating systems and time sharing revolutionized software. So now you don't need training to run a computer. Now your average everyday person can pick it up maybe in an hour of someone else explain it to them and they're off. So this brings us to the fourth generation of computers. Now we're in the 80s and 90s, uh, where computers have become so small that any household can buy one. This leads to the personal computer revolutionary, being that it's not just businesses buying mainframes and building a computer on an entire floor, but now moms and dads can just buy a computer and bring it home. The Atari happens right around here, and video game systems take off. Video game systems are just an example of a personal computer. Uh, so they start coming out, video games start selling in the millions, and all these parents wonder, what are my kids doing? They are wasting all their time on that thing, but video games are awesome, right? In the middle of this, another guy invents another thing that helps computers really take off, and he, it's called open architecture. And this is a concept that allows you to trade out parts of your computer one by one instead of replacing the whole thing. My tablet, my cell phone right now do not have an open architecture. They are closed. Somebody designed it and if you open it, you open it at your peril. You can't just unplug and plug stuff back in. To a point, I had to replace the screen on a tablet this summer. You can do that. Uh, but the early PCs, uh, they were towers and you could open them up and you could just pull the processor off and plug a new one in. Um, and this was huge. The very first one was the Altair 8800. Altair was the guy that invented it. Um, I think it was IBM 
asked him to design something for one of their things. And so he built this model, this computer where you can unplug parts and plug parts back in. And at the end of his project with them, when he delivered the, the final project to them, he said, by the way, I invented this cool new way of doing computers where you don't have to replace the whole thing, but I, I created pluggable parts. And do, do you guys want that at all? And they said, no, 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 we don't. No, but nobody, nobody wants that. Uh, we're fine. And he went on to sell millions and millions and millions of copies of it, of his open architecture. He thought it would be popular only among like the most elite, what we call hobbyists, people who just are fascinated in machines and inventing things. But everybody adopted his open architecture. I'll tell you a story about that really briefly. Uh, when I was about your age, I bought a video game and I plugged it in to our personal computer at home. And I got an error message saying, your computer cannot run this. You don't have enough RAM. You don't have enough memory to run this game. So I did some searches on the internet and I found out that I could actually just go down to the store, buy more RAM and just plug it right back into my computer. So that's what I did for 10 bucks. I went to the store, I paid 10 bucks. I got a RAM stick, came home, pulled the casing off my tower, plugged it in, and then it ran my video game fine. I've done that multiple times since. Most gaming PCs right now have an open architecture, crazy thing. Uh, so Altair, once again, makes computers easier to use for the average everyday person. He makes it easier to understand. Also in this generation, uh, suddenly more companies jump in. Microsoft is founded, a company called Who That Packard. It was founded in the 1930s, but they start making printers and they get into the computer industry. Apple is founded and the famous Microsoft Apple Wars uh, go on. Video game companies, Nintendo is founded in this. So um, you don't just have IBM anymore. Now you have company after company jumping in. Um, Apple is notable because they created the first spreadsheet software. It used to be if you were doing anything financial, money related, you had to write it all out by hand. They created a program called Visicalc that made it really easy uh, to do math uh, calculations to make things like budgets and spreadsheets. Uh, we're going to be working with Google spreadsheets in one in the easy computer class and that's Google Sheets is just another spreadsheet software. Uh, another company, Lotus123, updated it and made a better one and then we had Microsoft Excel. Uh, so Apple creates VisiCalc and the business world takes note. Now the average everyday grocery person doesn't have to write down every transaction by hand. Uh, they could just program it into a computer. Um, Apple also creates the first operating system that runs off of a graphical user interface or a GUI. Uh, Windows would then greatly improve on that. So instead of typing commands uh, into your system, you now had Windows and you had things that popped open and you could click an X to close it down and you could click the little minus sign to minimize it. Um, so you have a graphical user interface there, which makes computers that much easier to use. And now we are off and running. And now we are in the fifth generation although I personally think we're actually probably in the sixth generation now, uh, but the book was written about four or five years ago and they said we're at the tail end of the fifth generation. Uh, you know, because you're in the fifth generation of computers too, or at least you grew up in it, uh, you know the major things that happened with computer in the fifth generation. The big one is the internet. Um, and so, and networking. And internet is the network of networks. And so it's the granddaddy of them all. It was invented by a scientist who um, said to himself that uh, scientists are going to need to share information very easily with each other if scientific advancements are going to continue. So he created a way for scientists to log into a network of networks and share their information. Um, and then Everybody stood up and took note and said, we want to log on to that. And so you have chat rooms then you have social media uh, that's created out of that. Email, of course, becomes a thing. Um, and so that the Internet is the fifth generation. Internet browsers are released, uh, which are basically operating systems, but they don't operate your system. They, they help you operate and navigate the World Wide Web. Um, another significant thing that happens in the fifth generation, which you probably don't know as much about, is open source coding, which is a, just a concept where people that make a program just open it up 
and they say anybody can look at the code and anybody can do what they want to with the code. Um, a guy creates that in his dorm room. Uh, he creates an operating system that's now used on most Google devices, uh, which is crazy. And so open source code just says, we don't want to protect our code. We're just going to let anybody work on anything. So right now, worldwide, I can work with someone who I've never met and will never talk to, but I he can send me code or I can go on the internet and find his code and be like, oh, that's really cool. I do these other things. Uh, it's been used recently for video game mods. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have modded a game, but now video game companies are after a time, they say, go ahead, look at the code. If you want to turn your avatar in Skyrim into Mario, by all means, go ahead. Uh, do whatever you want to do uh, in this game. So now modding is a thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where we are. Uh, there's a few thoughts about where we might be in a few more years. Um, I, as I said, I think we're already past the fifth generation because the list of things in the book that they said would define the next generation, I'm already seeing happening. And there's three things you need to know um, about the next generation. About uh, I really think it's the generation we're in. Uh, one is artificial intelligence. Uh, computers are getting smarter. They are getting to the point where they can make decisions for themselves, where they can uh, look at a large amount of data and be able to make decisions based off of that data. I have a friend right now, he works in Sandy, just 20 miles south of where I am here in Layton, Utah. And uh, he is working on something called Deep Thought, which kind of sounds like scary, like robot apocalypse, right? Uh, but Deep Thought scours the World Wide Web for information and, and then uses it to draw summaries and draw conclusions about the way the world is. It's a fascinating thing um, that's happening and the internet has made it possible. Uh, we predicted robots, uh, fully thinking and functioning robots would happen in 1960, which is kind of silly. And the problem there was our robots didn't have enough information. Now, because we can uh, give a computer program access to the entire internet and teach it ways to thumb through that internet and draw conclusions, artificial intelligence is uh, now becoming a reality. And uh, we're using using it to do all kinds of things, uh, which is fascinating. Another thing that's driving that is what we call embedded computers, which means computers are in everything. Um, so my car has a computer in it. My watch has a computer in it. My phone has a computer in it. None of this was true uh, 30, 20, 30 years ago. My bank uh, has a computer in it, right? Uh, my bank is almost entirely a computer, which is kind of scary. So embedded computers, or they're just in everything. And then a third concept you need to know that's happening right now is what's called ubiquitous computing, uh, which is kind of like embedded computers, but ubiquitous computing just says, says that their computers are everywhere. So computers are controlling everything, they're in everything, they're embedded everywhere. Uh, so it's really this generation is the completion of the computing era. Now we all just run by computers. As I said, my bank is entirely computational. Uh, the stock market, like people actually used to go to a market and buy and sell stocks together. Now they all just do it using computers. The stock market is a computer. There's still a place uh, where the stock market is, where stock markets are, I should say. Uh, but ultimately, um, they're there. The movies I have, they're computers, right? It used to be I had to buy a VHS and it had a speaker in it and it had uh, all the images of the movie saved to a film. And then uh, now... Um, if I want to buy a movie, I just two clicks and my movies are all computers. My music is all computers. So uh, that's called ubiquitous computing. It's everywhere and everything. So that is a brief history of computers uh, from ancient Assyrian tablets to today. Uh, but it's quite fascinating. We're going to dig a heck of a lot more into that. If you were in class, we spent two whole days on this information. If you weren't in class, lucky you because it's only 38 minutes, 39 by the time I'm done. Uh, but hopefully I at least got you excited for some of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, later on. And so don't forget to check out the historical computing fact sheet. And if you turn it in early, I'll try to look at it and give you some pointers if you did it wrong. That's true of any assignment for any of my classes. So uh, buckle up because it's a fun journey. Uh, I hope you're excited. We'll see you next time.